Good evening, Captain Retired Matt Edwards here with the next installment of the Observation Post uh, Facebook Live Weekly Update. Now I'm not going to go through my numbered list today, I'm going to go through the two posts I made today. That's my new system. When I get up in the morning I look at some of the things I wrote down and then I expound on them, I elaborate on them to try to get people to understand about all the things I'm trying to basically educate people, to get people to open their eyes about things aren't as good as what the government would claim they are. So, without further ado, let me talk about my first post. I said, point number one, fiduciary duty has been on my mind a lot lately. A, the Otterson, Ontario Court of Appeal, 2002 case. The Crown owed a fiduciary duty to disabled veterans getting the pension when they could not manage their own affairs. The case was about the Crown not paying property or interest. B. Alt, Federal Court, 2003. The Crown has a special relationship with public servants. Sounds like a fiduciary duty to me. C. The Auditor General's 2014 admission that a trustee for a pension generally has a fiduciary duty. The Administrator for, you know, a trust, a pension, has a fiduciary duty. D, the Auditor General, 1991, on the fiduciary duty. And E, the per, uh, Pension Benefit Standards Act, which is a federal law, states that funds are to be held in trust. Now, for some reason, the government doesn't want to admit that the property in these pensions belong to the people. They think it belongs to the government. But the thing is, is that we are the government, but they don't think that it's the people in the who contributed to the pension that owns it. They think all of Canada owns it. But that's not how pensions work. Okay? You know, the uh, let's have a look at it. Let's see if I got it there. I mentioned it, so I probably put it in there. So, <clears throat> fiduciary duties. Now, this is the uh, 1991 um, Auditor General Report on Federal Pensions, and it says in paragraph 8.31, Fiduciary responsibilities for employee pension plans are not consistent with those prescribed for other federally regulated pension plans. Now, you see, that's what I'm trying to say. The rule of law is not being followed. The government claims that it doesn't have a fiduciary duty, but all pension administrators have a fiduciary duty. So, 8.31 says the Parliament, about, uh, Parliament excuse me, the Pension Benefit Standards Act sets out standards for pension plan financing and fund management. The PBSA requirements reflect generally accepted principles of pension fund management. Four key principles contained in the Act are relevant to any evaluation of the long-term financing and borrowing implications of federal pension arrangements. Number one, an employee, employer, excuse me, again, I'm looking at the sideways, I got bifocus on, I missed the word, an employer shall ensure with respect to its pension plan that pension fund monies are held in trust for the members and former members of the pension plan. Two, a pension fund shall be administered by a board of trustees, a pension slash pension committee. One member shall be a representative of the employees. That doesn't happen as far as I know. Three, the administrator shall have a clear fiduciary responsibility for the fund. Number four, the fund shall be prudently invested. Now you see, it's awful funny that the government doesn't follow the very law that it wrote. Now, okay, carrying on with the next point I was saying in my post, creditor. I might come back to the fiduciary because it's been bugging me so much because when you're a fiduciary, it <coughs> it's many times about money. When you have money that you're holding for somebody else, you have to act as a fiduciary. In other words, you have to act as if the person who's hold you're holding the money for it, their interest come before yours. Now <clears throat> in claiming that there's 
no fiduciary duty owed. The government is saying that it can just do what it wants. Number two, creditor, has also been on my mind. That is, I think, the opposite of debtor, or something like that. I say that the Crown is an unsecured creditor that abuses the due process of law and that there is no court case where the creditor moves from being an ordinary creditor to a judgment creditor. Now, I say this a lot. I used to be a tax collector of CRA in my daytime job. And if I wanted to take someone's property and sell it so I could then get the money to pay off the taxes, then I had to go through the process like any other creditor. And we had to go to court, get a judgment, get the judgment, send it to the sheriff, send it to the sheriff, the sheriff sees it and sells it. Then, after that, we get a portion of the proceeds. Now, what happens with things like the Canada Pension Plan? You get, sometimes you get the money, sometimes the money is sent directly to manual. But, the government acts as a creditor and says, you owe us money because you received money during the same period in which you got, say, the Canadian Forces Pension. So therefore, and in my case, it was a public service pension, I got a bill for $9,800. Now that means that I'm the debtor, they're the creditor, but instead of going to court and saying that this man owes us money because he received the Canada Pension Plan Disability at the same time that he got his public service pension, instead of that, they simply said they... I owed it, and they then collected it. Now, is it no wonder that I'm pissed off with these son of a bitches? Nobody will get away with ignoring the due process of the law, because the due process of the law is one of the things that's supposed to protect you, because you're supposed to have a procedure to follow. And that way, they can try to make sure things are done fairly by following a set procedure. Now, due process involves three things as far as I know. And I'm pretty damn sure of it, actually. One is notice about what they want to do to you. Number two is a hearing so that you can be heard. And number three is an impartial judge. Now, none of those are present when they say you owe money because you got some other money in the can of the pension plan, for example. None of them. Okay. Point number three, and I'm... Well, I almost skipped tonight, but I'm doing it anyway, but I'm going to try to keep it short. Number three, I plan to email the Office of the Veterans Ombudsman to follow up my recent call about why they should conduct a joint investigation into the Service Income Support Insurance Plan. Here are a few easily proven points off the top of my head. A. Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs Canada, Dara Mogan, stated that the CISIP and the earnings loss benefit had the same 120-day period to apply after release from the Canadian Forces because they designated rehabilitation and earnings loss benefit to be a mirror of CISIP LTD. B. The 2006 program arrangement is proof that CISIP is part of the Veterans Affairs Canada Rehab Program because Section 3.2.1 states that CISIP Financial Services is the first payer or provider of income replacement in the case of a medical release. That means Veterans Affairs Canada is the second payer, which is they're going to claw back CISA. But you know what they failed to do? They failed to put a law in place. And even if they did put a law in place, it wouldn't matter because they're still breaking provincial law, which I put a picture on my post here of the Newfoundland law, which is called the Accident and Sickness Insurance Act. And Section 29 says that insurance money is free from creditors. Now that would include Veterans Affairs Canada. Point number four, and I'm always talking about taxes. Point number four states that CISIP and IRB are taxed as income, yet they are subject to clawbacks. Income is not subject to this deduction unless a court orders a garnishment put in place, be put in place. Therefore, these payments are not really income. So the government wants to get its a portion of the money back under using the Income Tax Act to justify clawing back or reducing or deducting or setting off the compensation that is supposed to be paid for an injury in military service. Number five, public law versus duty versus private law duty. Now I searched, before I get into the point, I searched high and low today for the Kevin Victory quote that I was looking for. Now as I recall, he was a lawyer from a bunch of years ago that stated that the government didn't owe a duty to disabled veterans. Well, that set a fire under my fucking ass, and I don't think 
that anybody should have said that, especially someone who is a public servant. Off the top of my head, seeing that Kevin Vickery stated something like Canada owes no duty to disabled veterans, I'll review my group with its name, with his name, and see if I can recall this properly. His words made my blood boil. I recall, recall the Department of Justice bringing up a public law of duty in the Manoos case. Now, what they were talking about was Section 30 of the Pension Act, I believe. Contract law is private law created between consenting parties, and this topic might have come to mind as I was thinking there was no consideration in the program arrangement between the Department of National Defense, Veterans Affairs Canada, and CISIP Financial Services. Now, a little editorial comment. When I talk about the CISIP policy 901-102, there's CISIP Financial Services, and they are a branch of the Canadian Forces. Now, they're a non-public funds branch. They're not part of the government, per se, but they fall under the command of the Canadian Forces. Now, they are the ones that hold the CISIP policy, and they hired manually to administer it. Now, that makes CISIP Financial Services the, uh, the underwriter, not the Chief of Defense Staff, per se, but really, in the Manoj case, they said it was the government of Canada. Now, uh, consideration, or in brackets, I said money is always required in a legal agreement such as a contract. Which way would a consideration flow for that program arrangement? Would, uh, should VAC pay DND? Should CISIP Financial Services play VAC? Should DND pay CISIP Financial so Services, or vice versa? What a mess. What were they thinking? when they were screwing over the disabled Canadian Forces member, and <coughs> because in law there can be no clawback of CISIP long-term disability by anybody. A. CISIP long-term disability is non-indemnity and contributory, and I put my proof in there, Salt, British Columbia Court of Appeal, 2002. So it cannot be used to reduce damages, and Veterans Affairs Canada's income replacement benefit is a damages replacement. B. Provincial insurance law prohibits creditors from taking insurance, as it is good public policy, policy to protect insurance. C. The National Defense Act, Section 39.3, protects CISIP long-term disability, as it is non-public property. <coughs> On paper. <coughs> D. Veterans Affairs Canada failed to enact the clawback in Section 22 of the Veterans Wellbeing Act regulations. <coughs> Getting a bit dried out. Now, then I posted my email, because I whipped that up in a few minutes, because I got all this stuff on top of my head. Unfortunately, I know too much about this crap. I said, Dear Sir or Madame, the purpose of this email is to follow up on my earlier group report to the Office of the Veterans Ombudsman, the Canadian First Ombudsman, a possible investigation into the service income support insurance plan, Policy 901102 in relation to its incorporation into the Veterans Affairs Canada Rehabilitation Slash Income Replacement Benefit Program. Here are some points proving that there is a problem. 1. The Crown designed Rehab Income Replacement Benefit as a mirror for CISIP. Exhibit 1. Showing the comment by Dara Mogan in 2005. 2. The Fall 2012 Office of the Auditor General of Canada report stated that the programs were duplicates, implying tax money waste. Exhibit 2. CISA policy number 3. CISA policy 901-102 has a cost of living allowance exception from CLAVAC in section 24B and 44B of the policy, while Veterans Affairs Canada had the Veterans Wellbeing Act regulation section 27-3 to accomplish the same purpose. Exhibit 3 and 4. Point number 4. The Office of the Veterans Ombudsman 2013 report on the new Veterans Charter used CISIP and Income Replacement Benefit interchangeably. Exhibit 5. Number 5. Next. Both CISIP and Earnings Loss Benefit were set at 75% as the amount of income replacement. Point, uh, exhibit 6. Point number 6. The Canada Gazette from April 2006 stated that the Earnings Loss Benefit would top up CISIP LTD, Exhibit 7. Point number 7. The program arrangement signed by Veterans Affairs, the Department of National Events, and CISIP Financial Service excluded manually, first of all, when it was signed in 2006 and updated in 2012. But the main point is Section 3.2.1 of the, in air quotes, deal, where CISIP Financial Services is stated to be the first provider of income replacement in the case of medical release, 
Exhibit 8. The Crown Taxes, both CISB LTD and Earnings Loss Benefit slash Income Replacement Benefit under Section 6 of the Income Tax Act, that is, in, that is as if it was income from employment. But these are both a form of insurance. Using Section 61F to tax CISB long term disability and Section 61F.1 to tax income replacement benefit shows that they view these same things essentially to be essentially the same. That's Exhibit 9. Bill C-55, that was in 2011, states that a Canadian Forces, a disabled Canadian Forces member will get CISB LTD automatically, a practice imposed in 1999, but this doesn't apply universally because a disabled reservist cannot get it automatically. Exhibit 10. The program arrangement signed by the three parties has serious issues. For instance, Privacy Act Section 8 to A allows for the sharing of personal information collected by the Crown between different departments when the programs are similar. Yet, the program arrangement states that each department will continue to collect their own consent forms, which is a violation of Section 8 to A because no second consent form is required. Exhibit 11, I'm saying they broke the goddamn law. Number 11. Assistant long-term disability used to be a payment for life, but was changed in 1995 uh, to age 65. Veterans Affairs Canada used this age as well by admission in Veterans Affairs Canada's own 2005 reference paper. This change... Uh, led to income replacement benefit only in being paid to age 65, Exhibit 12. Now, what I forgot to put in there and that point, and I will do it before I send it, is that I think the Veterans Affairs Canada reference paper said that, you know, if they hadn't changed that in 1995 to not be a lifetime payment, then perhaps the earnings loss benefit would be a lifetime payment too. Now, so I had to go into what he brought in in 2006-15, uh, the Retirement Income Security Benefit. They brought in a kludge, a FUBAR program called the Retirement Income Security Benefit. And instead of just continuing the payment till you die, they decided to reduce the payment from 75 or 90% of your pay to 70% of the 75%. Or to 90%. Did I call them fucking assholes yet? Because they are fucking assholes. Now. Let me have a quick look at the pictures here. To see if there's anything I noted. Okay. The Otherson case. Here I am saying the government has a fiduciary duty to people. About retirement pensions. Now this. Is not a retirement pension. It's talking about the Pension Act pension. But according to the government. There's never a fiduciary duty. So. They said. At the very beginning, in the Osterson case, the Ontario Court of Appeal, it said Brockenshire J. was correct in finding the Crown had breached its fiduciary duty to the members of the class. Once a veteran is awarded a pension, the payments are the veteran's property, and the Crown is required by statute to administer the funds for the benefit of the veteran. See? They have to do it for the benefit. That means it's a fiduciary duty. Now, when I talked about creditors, Newfoundland's Insurance Act, Accidents and Sickness Insurance Act, says in Section 29, the header states, insurance money free from creditors. Now, the body of it says, where a beneficiary is designated, but I don't think that's particularly, you know, a hold up. Insurance money payable to him or her is not from the time of the happening of the event upon which becomes payable part of the estate of the insured is not subject to the claims of the creditors of the insured. So basically, it's good public policy not to take the money that's owed to people in insurance because then they'll have to go seek welfare. Now, what they said here about that guy, Dyer Mogan, the quote I have here, I don't know exactly where it came from, but it's fairly lengthy, so I could probably find it again really quick. On May the 11th, 2005, during the examination of Bill C-45 by the Standing Committee, Committee, the Standing Senate Committee on National Finance, Mr. Dara Mogan, the Executive Director, Service and Program Modernization Task Force, accompanying the Honorable 
Albina Guiarni or something, Minister of Veterans Affairs, was asked by Senator Kinsella to explain why new veterans charter clients had to apply for the earnings loss benefit within 120 days of being released from the Canadian Forces. Mr. Mogan replied, the number was chosen because an existing program under the authority of the Chief of Defense Staff, the Service Income Support Insurance Plan, has that 120-day limit. We do not want to create two standards. Now, that's a quote that I'm going to use in the future because they always have two standards. The fact that they have the Pension Act for the old veterans and the new veterans charter is creating two standards right from the get-go, you son of a bitch. <coughs> Okay, let me see. Uh, seeing I was talking about the sharing of personal information, section 8 2. Uh, 8 of the. Okay, let me explain about the Privacy Act. The Privacy Act is designed to protect people's privacy from the government. No kidding. Now, it, you're supposed to collect the information directly from the person, collect the minimum amount of information, and if you have similar programs, according to well, if it's not similar, you can ask for their consent. But Section 8 one says personal information under the control of government institutions shall not, without the consent of the individual to whom it relates, be disclosed by the institution except in accordance with this section. Now, Section 8 two says, subject to any other act of parliament which could override the Privacy Act, and that's the way I read that, personal information under the control of government institution may be disclosed, A, for the purpose with which the information was obtained or compiled by the institution, or and this is the part I'm talking about, for a use consistent with that purpose. Now, if the government wants to say that these programs are not similar, then they can stop clawing back from Veterans Affairs Canada's income replacement benefit. If they're not similar, why do you think you can claw it back, you son of a bitch? Now, uh, here's what I was talking about, not wanting to have, have two standards, according to Mogan, right? In the 2012 file report, of the Outer General, they talked about, or actually, my mistake, this is the Veterans Ombudsman report about improving the new Veterans Charter. The heading is improving the earnings loss benefit for part-time reservists. Now that's a redundancy. All reservists are part-time, them stupid bastards. The earnings loss benefit provided to medical release reserve force veterans is based on 75% of the deemed salary one standard amount of $2,700 a month, while the benefit for a full-time uh, reserve force or regular force veteran is based on 75% of their actual pre-release salary. So, the thing is, the difference between the two income support levels increases in rank. Now, see, I disagree with the use of the word income support because that reveals their true purpose, that they want to set up a welfare program. Income support is welfare. Welfare uses clawbacks. Now, if this was a true compensation program, even if it's not perfect, they wouldn't allow clawbacks because the Pension Act didn't have clawbacks except for things that happened based on the same event that caused your injury. And, I mean, they're just hoping that nobody notices. Or maybe they're too stupid to see it. Now, <clears throat> here's the Auditor General, Fall 2012. The heading states similar income support, again, welfare, and vocational rehabilitation programs in each department continues to create confusion and difficulties. No kidding. They set up two systems, and you're supposed to get both, but then they're trying to say you can only get one or the other, and they close back one to make it so that you can only get one of them. But that is confusing. It's not simple. That is the definition of confusing. So paragraph 4.77. Of our sample of 32 veterans who were eligible and participated in the vocational rehab, we found that three of them, about 9%, were also eligible and subsequently participated in the Veterans Affairs Canada Vocational Rehabilitation Program. In interviews, veterans and staff also told us that the forces members and veterans feel frustrated that they have to deal with the staff of multiple departments, submit the same documents over and over, and repeat their stories before they can get access to benefits and services. When I say these things, it's not just me. 
nobody should have to repeat their stories. That's traumatic. Over and over to some government fucking dingbat bureaucrat who only wants to cut you off or not approve you in the first place. Okay, let's see what I'm... Okay, so... I'm skipping through here trying to figure out what I'm going to say next and I'm looking at the Veterans Wellbeing Act regulations and they say the following sources are prescribed for the purpose of determination of B in section 19.1 of the Act. Now they don't come right out and say it, that these are the things that we're going to claw back. They put it in such arcane legal ease that I'm pretty sure that you can argue that this is not good law and have it struck down. But, Section A, Benefits Payable under the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act, the Public Service Superannuation Act, or the Employment Insurance Act. Why didn't they include the RCMP Superannuation Act? Seeing they were trying to catch everything in the one section. They could have also split them all up, because here's the thing. These are all different acts of parliament. 